All right, so good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, we're gonna be discussing chapter four, states of consciousness. And remember that this is being recorded um, and that uh, please feel free to ask questions, but if you do not want your voice broadcast on YouTube, you may type your questions in the chat. I will read them out loud and uh, for the benefit of all students and, um, and answer the question to the best of my ability. Um, so with that, here we go. Chapter four, states of consciousness. So the first thing we need to really discuss is what is consciousness, right? So um, right now, everyone in class, including me, hopefully, <laughs> are conscious, right? In other words, I'm aware of internal and external stim stimuli, right? Such as, you know, feelings, hunger, pain, um, detection of light as I look around my, as I look around my home, by the way, welcome to my home. Um, you know, so in other words, I am here, I'm aware. Um, you know, when I'm, I am, uh, you know, working with clients, right? That's one of the things that I'm looking for. What is their state of consciousness? What's their level of orientation, right? Are they alert? Um, are they wakeful? That's another thing, right? So, Wakefulness is high levels of sensory awareness, thought behavior, right? So as you participate in this class, um, assuming that I am <laughs> uh, uh, not too boring, I will help to maintain your wakefulness um, and your awareness and thought and behavior, so. And then of course, uh, sleep, which we all experience is a quiet and mysterious pause in our daily activity and we're, we're gonna be talking about um, sleep uh, to start off with tonight with states of consciousness. Um, so another thing that is addressed in this chapter is biological rhythms. And I think one of the most famous biological rhythm that, that everybody knows um, or most people know is the circadian rhythm, right? And that is the biological rhythm that basically occurs over a 24 hour period, right? And it's um, generated by the suprachiasmatic nucleus or the SCN. So you can say SCN for short because sometimes those big long words, I, I do know they can be uh, difficult. Sometimes I even trip over them. Um, and it also uh, manages the like the sleep wake cycle, right? Is one of our main circadian rhythms. And that is linked to the elements of of uh, natural light and darkness, right? And so we'll talk about how um, serotonin is, is impacted by light versus darkness. Uh, but in general, a biological, uh, sorry, I uh, tripped over my tongue. Biological rhythm is an internal cycle of biological activity, right? So when you think of hunger, that is part of your biological rhythm your levels of alertness, um, you know, a, a menstrual cycle is a biological rhythm. Fluctuations in your body temperature. Um, it is quite normal for your body temperature to fluctuate during the day. You know, what's interesting with, with the recent, recent uh, COVID-19 situation, which uh, we are all still being impacted obviously as evidenced by not being able to meet in person for this course. Um, but one of the things is, is there's been a lot of temperatures being taken. That's a lot of data points. And I was read an article uh, late last year that talked about um, the 98.6, which has been standard for people. It now appears that we're actually on average uh, have an average lower body temperature than that, right? So it's just kind of interesting, but if that is part of your uh, biological rhythm, that internal cycle. And then what is it that controls our biological rhythms, right? And so that would be the hypothalamus. You'll see that later on. Um, you'll actually see the suprachiasmatic uh, nucleus as well um, later on uh, when we're looking at pictures of the brain. And then this is a chart from the book that, that basically demonstrates 
the circadian rhythm or the change in body temperature over 28 hours for, um, for um, it says here, eight young men. So they put all these data points together. And so you'll notice here, um, there's some data points that are uh, slightly above 98.6, uh, but they drop down as far as 97 point, eh, let's just say somewhere in the 97.6 range or 97.5.5, five, uh, five, five range, right? So you can see that that rhythm uh, fluctuates throughout the day and that is normal. All right, so let's talk about the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So these are all the things that are involved with that, right? So um, light is a major, um, major uh, trigger for this. And um, this is located, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, um, in the hypothalamus. And it basically serves as your brain's clock mechanism. And it sets itself uh, with light information re received through the projections of the retina. And what this does is this allows your brain, it allows it to sync with the outside world. Um, you may be asked a question about the hypothalamus. Um, uh, I don't believe I have anything on the pituitary gland uh, or the um, pineal gland. Um, I just kind of want you to understand the basic of it. You won't have to know exactly where it's located in the brain or anything like that. I used to do a pop quiz that um, in class, if we were in class, you would probably get it. Um, where I'd put out a piece of paper with, with a brain on it and ask for some basic structures, but you guys are being spared that this semester. Um, but on the exam, I, I don't have anything like this. So I don't want you to concern yourself too much about this. I do want you to understand the basic, um, uh, the basic purpose of the hypothalamus and the uh, uh, suprachiasmatic uh, nucleus, the SCN. Any questions so far, you can type it in the chat or you can shout it out. I don't see any, so just let me know, just stop me if you need to. All right, so now we're gonna move into like melatonin and sleep regulation and so Remember earlier and before that, we were talking about um, how light um, helps reset our brain's clock, right? And so um, melatonin is one of those examples of that. So melatonin is released um, when it gets dark. So uh, it's stimulated by darkness and it's designed to make us sleepy. Um, and when it becomes daylight, uh, then melatonin is inhibited. So um, going back to last chapter, if you'll recall when we were talking about excitatory and inhibitory um, neuronal function, so your melatonin neurons are being inhibited by light in this particular case. And then of course, sleep regulation is the brain's control of switching between sleep and wakefulness, as well as coordinating the cycle with the outside world. And again, that's mainly based on, on light and darkness, right? And resetting that clock. Um, however, I do wanna point out that each person, um, oh, let me turn on my laser pointer so you can see, cause I'm, I'm kind of like focused on here, right? Each person has an individual pattern of activity uh, known as a person's uh, chronotype, right? So for example, the very first, so this class on the first day of class, this module um, canvas course was available at midnight. And I, oh, I'm not talking to you Siri, <laughs> at midnight and, um, at 1.38 in the morning, one of you late night owls was up checking out my course. And then there was another student, right? Who was up really early in the morning. Uh, I believe it was like 5.30-ish. 
that was on the um, was on the Canvas site, checking out things, right? And so I'm using that as an example because obviously one person's chronotype is they tend to like to be a night owl. Another person's chronotype is uh, is they're an early riser, right? So um, just an interesting fact. I think I even sent out an email about that. For you guys, I know I'll have a late night while I was right. All right, so now let's talk about some disruptions to sleep, right? So what disrupts our normal sleep? A couple of things that are mentioned in the book. Um, one thing uh, that I'm gonna highlight first, I know it's out of order on the slide, is rotating shift work, right? So uh, a work schedule that changes from early to late on a daily basis can really impact a person's ability uh, for their normal circadian rhythm to be maintained, right? And what this what it can do is it can result in persistent feelings of exhaustion. People are, um, might be short with you, maybe a little rude, they're, they're agitated. Um, it can also, sleep problems can also lead to signs of, uh, of depression and anxiety as well, right? So sleep disturbance um, can do that. Uh, using a bright light can be used to, uh, realign your biological clock with the external environment. So, so I know some people like uh, uh, work like the midnight shift or, or the third shift, right? From, you know, 11 a.m. to, I mean, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. or midnight to eight. Um, that can, even just doing that can throw off your, um, your biological rhythm, right? So if you work in a 24 hour facility, like back in the day, I used to be a casino manager way back in the day. And, um, and I did third shift. And, uh, you know, so you sleep during the day and be up at night and that kind of throws you off. The other thing is jet lag. And so jet lag is symptoms resulting from the mitch, excuse me, mismatch between our internal circadian rhythms and our environment. So if I get on a plane and I fly five hours east, right, to, uh, to the East Coast, I, I will probably experience some jet lag. Why? Because I'm used to, you know, the, the, my rhythm here, I get back there and the time period might be three hours off. It's even worse if you have flown halfway across the globe, um, which I have done as well. Um, and anybody in here that's done it can probably testify to that, especially if you spend 24 hours on a plane flying from LAX to um, uh, to Indonesia, that's quite a long, quite a long trip. So, all right, all right. Looks like we have a question. Let me turn off my laser pointer so that it will work right. And yeah, so someone is sharing. Um, started off strong this month, waking up early, getting everything done until the end of the month when I begin to feel exhausted and anxiety, which caused stress, right? And that's, um, uh, and, and, and that is another thing, right? And then that begins to affect our sleep, right? So one of the things that when I'm working, thank you for sharing that. Um, one of the things when I'm working with, with my clients um, is, uh, working on sleep hygiene and sleep hygiene is very important for um, helping people to get to a normal sleep routine. And so for example, one of the things I tell my clients if they're having trouble sleeping is um, first of all, making sure that in your bedroom, no TV. When you're laying in bed, bed is only for two things and two things only, sleep and sex. And if you're doing anything else other than sleeping or having sex in bed, then what you're doing is you're cueing your body, right? And we'll learn about this when we talk about Pavlov's dogs and classical conditioning, but you're cueing your body um, to not go to sleep because you're used to doing other activities in bed, playing on your phone, playing video games, watching TV, all of that stuff can impact your sleep hygiene. So if there's issues with that, maybe consider a, a, a sleep hygiene plan. 
So why is sleep deprivation bad, <laughs> right? This is what we talk about. Um, we've already kind of talked about, you know, um, uh, anxiety, depression, irritability, uh, those kinds of things, which impact our interactions with other people, correct? And um, so that can also result in more issues. Um, but there's a couple, couple things we wanna talk about here, right? So first thing is a concept known as sleep debt, right? And sleep debt is the result of insufficient sleep on a chronic basis. So if you're going and you're getting, you know, four hours sleep, five hours sleep, two hours sleep, and, and this is, you know, uh, consistent days, um, you're actually in sleep debt. You're not getting enough sleep. You're not being um, uh, refreshed and rested, which is really important. And then there's sleep rebound, and that is a sleep deprived individual will tend to take a shorter time to fall asleep during subsequent opportunities to sleep. Some other issues with sleep deprivation, and, and here we have um, <coughs> the outline of a human body and, in, <coughs> and it's pointing to different areas, right? So we talked about some of this, right? Irritability, um, something I hadn't talked about yet, but I'm gonna mention now, is sleep deprivation also leads to cognitive impairment. In other words, you just don't sleep as well. I mean, uh, sorry, you just don't think as well. I misspoke, so you don't think as well. There's memory lapses and you can actually experience memory loss. So let's just talk about the upcoming exam. One of the things that I talk to students about when it comes to the exam is cramming is not the best way to take an exam. One, you often will deprive yourself of sleep in order to cram, which is already putting you at risk at cognitive impairment, memory lapses, right? Um, and so you may not do as well. So that's why it's always better to pace yourself throughout a course, right? Do the readings in such a manner that you're able to, to do them and take them in, do the homework in such a way that you can do them and take them in, and then not have to cram and rush everything the last weekend um, because you just set yourself up, right? So um, I always take a moment when we're talking about sleep deprivation and and hit and say that. Um, some other issues would be like impaired moral judgment. Um, people can actually experience hallucinations. Um, you can experience symptoms that, are, that may resemble or mimic um, ADHD or you know, adult, adult deficit um, uh, and hyperactivity, right? So uh, it can mimic that sleep can also impact your immune system. It can actually lower your immune response, uh, increases your risk for diabetes. Um, there's increased uh, heart rate variability. Uh, your muscle, your muscle memory will suffer from that. You'll have um, uh, increased reaction time. So in other words, it's gonna take you longer to react to something. So if you're driving in a car, and you're sleep deprived, your reaction time is actually going to be longer, which may cause you to have a fender bender, right? Um, all right, uh, hold on one second, sorry. A couple people in the waiting room, let them in, and we're back. So, so these are some of the things that, that sleep deprivation um, uh, can cause an impact. Are there any questions to this point? All right. So what is sleep? So sleep is, <coughs> I know this sounds like an obvious question and answer, but it's marked by relatively low active physical activity right? Um, you're definitely experiencing a reduced sense of awareness. Um, and the other thing about sleep is that the sleep-wake cycles are controlled by multiple brain areas. So it's not just one necessarily brain area that does it. Earlier, we were talking about the, the supra um, 
chiasmatic um, uh, nucleus, the SCN, um, the hypothalamus. Now we're talking about the thalamus, you'll notice here, um, and the pons, which um, impacts or has um, is connected to REM, REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And sleep is associated with the secretion and regulation of hormones, the most famous being melatonin, which we've already talked about, um, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, and growth hormone, which is, um, I did forget to mention uh, down here on this diagram, it also shows that uh, growth suppression can be um, associated with sleep deprivation, right? Uh, risk of obesity, that kind of stuff. And that's because of the growth hormone and so. And then he, this is from your book here. It just shows the different um, wavelengths for the um, <laughs> um, physical variables, what's going on during, during sleep. And let's see, it looks like we have a question. Let me turn off my laser pointer, go back up to that. Uh, yes, so one of your fellow students is making a comment um, stating that uh, when I was deployed, by the way, thank you very much for your service. Um, I wanted to say, ooh, rah, but um, sorry former Marine here, but um, when I was uh, deployed on a ship, we worked 12 hour shifts and my coworkers used melatonin, never worked for me. Do you know why that may be possible? So that's a really good question. And here's what I'll, I, I, I don't know. What I'm going to uh, relay in answer to your question, and it won't answer it directly uh, because I don't know. Um, is that what I have understood and I've been like looking for some studies just to see if there's any um, real veracity to this, but people using melatonin a lot, right? Um, may be impacting that uh, production in the brain. Now that's just an educated guess on my part. I don't really have any, um, uh, like I said, I tried to look for some research articles. What I'm basing this educated guess on is based on my um, understanding of addiction. And so what happens with addiction is for instance, uh, dopamine will get used up in addiction and it won't produce, you won't produce enough dopamine as an example, right? Because it's being impacted by a substance being introduced into the brain. So if I had to take a guess, melatonin, if you're taking too much of that, it may be having the same impact. But the best way to get the, that answer would be if you're having sleep problems, really to consult your doctor on that. And um, is melatonin the best, uh, best thing? The other thing is, what's the quality control on the melatonin you were taking? Is it made by, you know, uh, so some of the stuff you can buy over the counter, it, it, are you really getting what you're paying for, right? And if you watch TV and you look at these commercials, it'll say like not FDA approved. And what that means is, is nobody's really looking at it for quality control that much, right? So let's see. Uh, I just worked, finished working in a pharmacy. Oh, maybe we have an answer here. I just finished working as pharmacy for six years and the clinical efficacy of melatonin is low because it is usually effective in small doses, but clinical evidence for larger doses isn't great, which is exactly, yes, thank you. Um, because that is, because I've tried to find this and that, that's exactly what I was thinking as well. So thank you for confirming my somewhat educated guess on that. Uh, people with sleep apnea, are also in this category. Yes, and sleep apnea, we are about to talk about in a slide or two. So you guys are, you know what? This class is just awesome. You guys are doing, you guys are engaged. 
and I know the difficulty with Zoom. Um, so I just wanna just say, I really appreciate, uh, uh, I really appreciate this. So you guys are doing great. Um, all right, so here's the brain areas. We've already seen some of this already before. And like I said, I'm not really gonna test you uh, like I might if we were actually in class, but um, I do want you to understand about the thalamus and the hypothalamus and the suprachiasmatic um, uh, nucleus um, and the pituitary gland and the pons. And we've also talked about these in previous chapters. So this is one of those examples where, yes, the tests aren't, uh, you know, the stuff isn't necessarily cumulative, but there will be repeated um, episodes in the semester. And this is, this is one of those examples. All right. Um, All right, so why do we sleep? So there's a couple, couple things to address. So uh, one is the adaptive function, which is an ev evolutionary hypothesis. And what that says is, is that sleep is essential in order to restore resources that are expended through the day. Um, and that sleep is an adaptive response to predatory risks which increase in darkness, right? So there is little evidence to support these explanations. And again, you'll notice that it says, hi, oh, let me turn on my laser pointer, hypothesis. So remember the difference between a theory, which is a well-developed set of ideas based in um, evidence and, um, and uh, researched, right? Whereas a hypothesis is actually gonna be um, what is being researched, right? So if we're just, if we're only stuck with the hypothesis and there's no evidence behind it, just remember, don't confuse theory and hypothesis. Um, cognitive function, that's an, uh, this is another uh, area. So focuses on sleep's importance for cognitive function and memory formation. So research shows that sleep deprivation results in disruptions in cognition and uh, memory deficits, and that these impairments become more se severe as the amount of sleep deprivation increases. The more sleep you lose, uh, the worse your cognitive function gets. Um, and then slow wave sleep appears to be essential for effective memory formation, right? And we're gonna talk about dreaming here in a minute. Um, and it looks like another question has come in. Uh, oh yes, people take siestas in, in Spain, yeah. Um, you know, and that's another, and I don't have any evidence, but it does bring up some anecdotal things that, that we hear, right? Um, that short naps during the day can be helpful. That if your nap is too long, right? Now, I, I have not personally done research on that. That's why I am labeling it anecdotal at this point. Remember the difference between anecdotal and empirical is empirical has evidence and research behind it. That statement, uh, an empirical statement it has research and evidence behind it. Um, my anecdotal statement regarding naps and siestas is just that. It's like, this is what I've heard, this is what I've seen, uh, but I don't have the research on that. And, that, and the culture of siestas is, uh, is interesting too. Um, so what are some benefits of sleep? Uh, maintaining healthy weight is one benefit. Lowering stress levels, improving mood, um, your motor coordination uh, is increased. Um, and getting back to cognition and memory, um, <coughs> that is also improved. All right, so there are four, uh, so I'm sorry, misspoke, five stages of sleep. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about each one. Uh, over the next several slides. 
So first let's hit some brain waves. <laughs> so brain wave activity, um, and I think a lot of people already know this, but changes dramatically across different uh, stages of sleep, right? So there's, you have alpha waves, which are very low frequency, um, relatively high amplitude and synchronized um, uh, waves. And then you have um, theta waves. So if you look at this chart, let me put on my laser pointer. So this is, this is awake, right? This is awake con consciousness, right? Stage one or non-REM sleep, uh, this is your alpha waves. And this also is in the book too. Uh, and then your non-REM stage two theta rays, uh, uh, waves, sorry, not rays, waves, um, are low frequency, low ampl amplitude waves. But then this is also where you will experience these sleep spindles that I know you read about um, and K complexes. And then stages three and four are also non-REM um, and these are known as delta waves. And these are low frequency, um, high amplitude, um, and uh, not synchronized. And you can see the difference. So synchronized, right? Tends to be a little, little uh, more of a pattern to it. The desynchronized is a, a little bit more, um, the pattern is much more difficult to, to discern. So that's the difference between the synchronized and the, and the desynchronized. And then REM, or rapid eye movement uh, sleep is uh, demonstrated down here at the bottom. It's interesting because it's almost, but not quite, almost looks like alpha. All right. So stage one is the transitional phase between wakefulness and sleep. Um, this is when your respiration will begin to slow down this is when your heartbeat will slow down, um, your core body temperature will decrease, your muscle tension um, basically decreases, right? You, you're becoming relaxed, in other words. <clears throat> and then this is where alpha waves um, occur. Then moving from stage one into stage two, your body is now going into deep relaxation. Um, this is where the theta rays are, uh, theta waves are. Um, and it's also characterized by the appearance of, of the sleep spindle, which is demonstrated here, pictured here, and the K complex, um, which is demonstrated uh, on the uh, right side. And what a sleep spindle is, it's a rapid burst of high frequency brain waves. And you can see that. And then the K complexes are very high amplitude um, brain activity. So frequency is measured across, amplitude is measured from top to bottom. So for those that are wondering, what's he talking about amplitude and, um, and frequency? Stages three and four are um, slow wave sleep. This is where your delta, delta waves appear. Um, here it's demonstrated by the reddish, brownish, orangish um, line here. And, uh, and then this is also a measurement of uh, delta waves in that. And next we'll move into rapid eye movement. This is the one where people uh, I think a lot of you students know this already. You know, if you if you watch somebody sleeping, not to be a creep, but <laughs> sorry, but if you if you see somebody sleeping, if you're conducting an experiment on sleep, and you see a person's um, eyes darting back and forth underneath their eyelids, you can see their eyes moving. That is a person that is experiencing rapid eye movements. Um, during rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. Um, your body naturally uh, will paralyze your voluntary muscles. In other words, you, you become kind of frozen. Um, this is where dreams occur. And uh, the brain waves are similar to those seen in, in um, 
uh, in wakefulness. I actually misspoke earlier. I said it's kind of like um, alpha waves, but it's, it's more similar to wakefulness. So I want to correct my misspeaking from before, um, which is very interesting, right? And so uh, uh, many people will remember their dreams. Some people won't. And we're going to talk about dreams here too. Um, but one of the things that's really interesting about rapid eye movement is uh, the idea behind it is, is that um, your brain is, is consolidating um, memories and events um, and, and, and doing some kind of processing behind there. One of the things that as a therapist that I have been trained in is um, EMDR, which is eye movement and desensitization and reprocessing, right? Which is, uh, which uses the um, bilateral stimulation of eye movements um, to replicate REM sleep, but only for longer periods of time during wakefulness. So um, it's, it's really interesting. I really like doing EMDR and, uh, but it has its basis in uh, reprocessing. Works really well with trauma um, and it works really well with um, addiction as well. So, um, that's kind of where that came from, one of the theories behind that. And we have a question. Let's see. Let's see. Wow, okay, interesting. So not sharing the student's name, but um, talking about a relative that um, was having seizures. And then one of the things that the, um, uh, the doctor did was to have him wear um, basically an, do, conduct an EEG test for 24 hours. And then it was realized during this person's sleep that they were also having seizures. So very interesting, very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. And then the link for the bilateral study, um, that's one of those things that you can, um, I, I don't have a, a particular link, um, but there's lots of research on it. Uh, I'll bet if you uh, go to the uh, library, the, um, the databases that I showed you on how to do your research for uh, your research paper, you will find plenty on EMDR. So, um, and you can always send me an email and we can meet offline to go uh, deeper into that if you'd like. All right. Let's see here. Hold on, sorry, I gotta turn off my pen because my pointer isn't working right. All right. Um, so here is a hypnogram that kind of demonstrates the your sleep cycle and it, you'll notice. So <clears throat> along this axis, right? It says awake, REM sleep stages one, two, three, and four. Uh, and you'll notice that from awake, it goes down and then it will go back up and then down uh, and back up. And I don't know if anybody here tracks their sleep. I actually do, cause I'm kind of a, a nerd and a geek in that way. Um, and I get uh, uh, a graphic display that shows, uh, shows my sleep. What's interesting though, I'll be honest is, is I don't know how accurate it is. Um, I just do it because I'm kind of a geek in that way, um, but it often does resemble um, this, although I usually only get about seven hours of sleep. So if you ever have, have time and want to play with something like that, it's it's kind of interesting, kind of cool. All right, any any questions before we move into dreams? All right. So when it comes to dreams, um, you know there are there are two people specifically, uh, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, um, that really addressed dreams, right? And so Freud 
he saw dreams as a way to gain access to the unconscious. And, and he actually looked at dreams as um, uh, that people's dreams were, were like insight into their unconscious. And, um, and there was two different types of content that he had, right? So there's manifest content, which is the actual content of the dream, right? So what happened? Who was chasing who? What was going on, right? Um, what actually happened in the dream? And then the second part, the other content that he would talk about is what's known as latent content. The content. And what latent content was, was the hidden meaning um, behind the dream. So I'm gonna use an example uh, and I hope I don't offend anybody uh, with this. So just bear with me um, because I'm, uh, I'm using this example as Freud would use it. And I will tell you, Freud, uh, he related everything to phallics and to sexual desire, right? So if a person, if a woman, and I'm gonna use it as a woman because he was also, oh gosh, I'm being recorded. I probably get in trouble for saying this. He was a little bit sexist, I think, um, when, you, when you look at some of his work, but he, he, he focused on women a lot. Um, but if a woman had a dream that she was being chased by a snake, that was the manifest content. That's what happened in the dream. And Freud would say that the hidden meaning behind that was that the snake represented a penis and her running away from it um, is really the hidden meaning is her own fear of sexual intimacy. And that's how he would interpret it, right? And so I'm using that example from Freud um, uh, to demonstrate manifest content and latent content. It's a very oversimplified um, uh, explanation. However, knowing, knowing what I know about uh, what I've learned about Freud, everything was, was, was tied to sex, right? Um, and Carl Jung believed that dreams allowed us to tap into what he called the collective unconscious. Um, and for him, the collective unconscious was basically a repository of information that we all share, uh, regardless of our culture, right? Um, and he believed that certain symbols and dreams reflected certain universal archetypes, like the hero, for example, right? And so he, he believed in this, in this uh, collective unconscious that all human beings share um, regardless of their culture. There's a lot of cross-cultural similarities, he would say. And it looks like we have a question here. So let's see. Okay, thank you for letting me know. All right. Um, so what research says is that dreams may represent life, and, uh, life events that are important to the dreamer. Um, they also may represent a state of proto-consciousness or a virtual reality in the mind that helps the person during consciousness. And then there are lucid dreams where certain aspects of wakefulness are maintained during a dreaming state and a person becomes aware that they are dreaming. So um, some of the theories on dreaming. Any questions? Any questions on manifest versus latent content or the collective unconscious? Because I know you can expect to see this in the homework and you will also see similar questions on the exam regarding these. So professor, it is normal that sometimes we remember our dreams and sometimes not? Yes, that is normal as far as I know, yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny, I, uh, I, I've talked to people in the past that uh, said, well, I never dream. I'm like, well, you know, I don't know that that's true. I think everybody dreams, you just may not remember it, right? So, but yes, that is normal. All right, so insomnia. So insomnia is defined by um, having difficulty 
either falling asleep, like you lay in bed and you toss and turn for a while and you just cannot fall asleep, or if you fall asleep, you're not able to maintain sleep. So you wake up um, uh, throughout the night, right? And it's not a restful sleep. And, um, and that this occurs for at least three nights a week for one month's time. So in order to be able to be diagnosed with insomnia, it has to occur at least three nights a week or 12 times in a month is basically what we're talking about, right? Um, insomnia every once in a while is, um, you know, the inability to fall asleep or stay asleep um, can be part of a normal person's, you know, thing. But if, if you're having this frequently, then you may have a sleep disorder that you might want to have checked out, right? Um, and, oh, there's a typo here, um, may be associated with symptoms of depression as well, right? So sleep disturbance is one of those things that when I'm assessing someone for depression um, or anxiety also, um, is how is your sleep, right? And, uh, and if it's disturbed, they're experiencing insomnia, or if they're experiencing hypersomnia, that may also um, be indicative of depression as well. So it looks like we have a question. Ah, deja vu, that is coming back. Uh, actually, I think I have that on another slide, um, but deja vu is, um, is, uh, is probably from a dream um, or a, a prior memory that just may not be fully remembered. Like, ooh, I think I've done this before. Um, so, but, uh, yeah, it could be a weird feeling too. Um, we're gonna hit that here in just a second. So other contributing factors to insomnia might be age, um, drug use, right? So if you're using methamphetamine, you won't sleep for days. Um, exercise, so if you're doing that, so uh, remember earlier I was talking about um, uh, sleep hygiene. So exercising right before you go to bed may not be helpful, right? Um, might key you up, it just depends. Um, your mental status, right? So if you're worried, experiencing some anxiety, uh, have a lot of things going on your mind, you know, have a lot of things on your mind. Um, and then bedtime routines, right? So remember what I said, the bed is used for only two things, right? Sleep and sex. Um, you're doing anything else around that or doing any other routines that cues your body to be more alert, um, that could interrupt or cause issues with sleep. Um, some treatment for insomnia is uh, stress management techniques. Um, also, interestingly, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, which focuses on cognitive problem uh, processes and um, certain problem behaviors um, has been shown to assist with insomnia as well. All right, so parasomnia is, involves unwanted motor behavior or experiences that occur during the sleep cycle, right? So one example is sleepwalking. Um, and this usually occurs, uh, occurs during slow wave sleep. Um, REM sleep behavior disorder occurs when the muscle paralysis that normally occurs does not occur. Um, and so there might be some high levels of physical activity that occur during REM sleep. Um, and this can be treated with uh, anti-anxiety medication, right? So then there's restless leg syndrome that can also be associated with, you know, uncomfortable ses uh, uh, sensations in the legs, right? You're trying to go to sleep and your legs just don't want to stop, right? Um, and there's some medications that uh, that can treat that. So you would need to see your doctor. And then um, night terrors. So a night terror is where the sleeper, the person sleeping, experiences a, a sense of panic and may scream, yell out. It can be very loud. Uh, it can scare other people that, you know, uh, may be around. Try to es uh, escape. Um, and these occur during non-REM sleep. 
And then somebody earlier asked about sleep apnea. So here is uh, sleep apnea, right? So that occurs when individuals stop breathing during their sleep. And it usually occurs for 10 to 20 seconds or longer. Um, the issue is, is that the repeated disruptions uh, lead to increased levels of fatigue. <coughs> And it can be common for people who are overweight. And there are two types. There's the obstructive um, sleep apnea, and that's where the airway is being blocked and air is being prevented from entering the lungs. So that's one. And then there's the central sleep apnea where the central nervous system itself fails to initiate breaths. Treatment can include um, CPAP device, um, which actually pumps air directly, excuse me, into the person's airwaves. So that's how that gets treated. And we have a question. So a question about um, if a person is crying in their sleep, is that a part of that? And I'm wondering if we're talking about the, uh, parasomnias, right? Um, could be. Uh, I'm not sure that I can, I'm qualified to answer that question, um, but it could be something related here. Um, my recommendation would be to uh, speak to a physician about that and, and uh, they may do a referral to a sleep expert. Um, you know, they do sleep studies and all kinds of stuff. So might be able to find some answers. All right, so uh, let's see here. And then sadly, we also need to um, kind of address SIDS, right? Uh, sudden Infant Death Syndrome, which, you know, horrible. Um, this occurs when the infant stops breathing during sleep and as a result, uh, the infant you know, passes away, right? They die. Um, Infants less than a year are at the highest risk and boys seem to have a greater risk than girls. And so some contributing factors that have been identified are things such as premature birth, um, smoking within the home, uh, and then hyperthermia, which is uh, cold. So, um, and then of course there's the sleep safe or safe to sleep campaign, right? That educates the public on how to minimize the um, risk factors associated with, uh, with SIDS. And I do know that's a homework question. You may see this on the exam as well. And then there's narcolepsy. Um, and this is the irresistible urge to fall asleep during wake hours, right? And it's often triggered by states of heightened arousal or stress. Um, and then the person that experiences this shares many features of REM sleep, um, including, including the loss of muscle tone while awake, right? So remember that sleep paralysis that we were talking about? And then hallucinations, right? The, the vivid, dreamlike um, hallucinations. Um, and the way that gets treated is with uh, psychomotor stimulant drugs. Um, so there is treatment for that. So if that's a person can um, can get help for that. I'm trying to think of the name of the movie. There was a movie about a guy. It's an old one. It's not really important, but it just came to my head um, where he would just fall asleep in the middle of the day. All right. So let's do this. It is 1901 hours for civilians out there, that's 7.01 p.m. So we're gonna take a break. Uh, we'll come back, I'll give you guys until, I wanna give you more than, so let's come back at 7.20 p.m. And, uh, and then we'll move into substance use disorders. And I'm gonna pause the recording here. Um, and and then we'll be back. Uh, 
So a minute ago, um, before we moved into this, I, we were talking about SIDS and I had accidentally misspoke and said hyperthermia was cold. Remember, hyper is in excess or above the norm and hypo means um, below the normal. So in this case, hypothermia would be increased um, temperature, right? So I misspoke earlier and I, I said the opposite. So my apologies. So I wanted to correct that. Um, and uh, it's, um, um, uh, good when students point that out, right? So thank you uh, very much. Cause sometimes I catch myself when I say something, I catch it. And then other times I don't uh, cause I think I've said the right thing. So uh, good job helping me out. All right. Um, so, so now we're gonna start discussing substance use disorders. And um, one of the things that um, is, is listed here that we're gonna talk about is the difference between physiological dependence on a substance and psychological dependence on a substance, right? And so basically um, the main definition for a substance use disorder in general is a compulsive pattern of drug use despite having negative consequences. And the book that's pictured here, uh, excuse me, just one second. Uh, sorry, I've been doing pretty good tonight without too much of a coughing fit. Um, but that one came on, so I apologize. Uh, anyway, as I was saying, so substance use disorder is a compulsive pattern of drug use despite having negative consequences, right? And so when I assess people for or diagnose them for substance use disorder, there's, there's 11 criteria for that that I'm looking at, right? Part of that is um, any um, pharmacological uh, indicators um, which would include tolerance and withdrawal, right? So tolerance and withdrawal is associated with physiological dependence. And the reason for that is, is because in physiological dependence, um, the body actually changes in their normal body functions um, and experience withdrawal from the drug when, <clears throat> when the drug is stopped, when they no longer are using the drug, putting it in their bodies. Um, and then psychological dependence is the emotional need for the drug. Um, so a person may go through withdrawal, uh, may experience some cravings, but, but they're not really tissue dependent anymore. They, they've kind of, they're, they're over the acute withdrawal part. Um, <clears throat> And now it's the psychological dependence that, uh, that can be an issue uh, le also leading to uh, relapse into using a substance. So this chart kind of demonstrates, it's a kind of a complex sort of Venn diagram thing going on here, right? Um, so there are several categories. And let me turn on my pen so we can kind of highlight uh, highlight them as I talk about it. Uh, so here's my laser pointer. So one class of drug that's kind of off by itself here are um, antipsychotics, right? And these are used to treat individuals that are experiencing symptoms of like uh, schizophrenia, you know, they're having um, uh, uh, audio, visual hallucinations, things like that. Um, and so these are your antipsychotics. Um, usually not drugs of abuse, um, uh, but they're important to, to, to mention because it is a, a category of drug. Um, the main categories of drug that we are going to talk about, and you'll also see there's some overlap with it, is um, our stimulants, depressants uh, and hallucinogenics, okay? So 
the way drugs are categorized is based on what their effect is. So I'll give you an example. You ask a lot of people what type of a drug alcohol is, and well, I don't know. Somebody, uh, somebody brave, want to shout a out? Okay, it's a depressant. Any other guesses? Depressant is correct, by the way, but sometimes I hear other guesses. Don't be afraid. All right, I'll just say it. Sometimes people will say, well, it's a stimulant because, you know, when I go out drinking, um, it makes me feel good. It has, uh, it, uh, um, uh, it gets me going, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and, and alcohol is one of those, uh, one of those drugs that can seem like a stimulant at times, um, but that's not how it's categorized. It's categorized by its effect on the central nervous system, what it does um, in, inside your body. And what it does is it, it actually depresses it, right? Um, so that's how things are categorized. Uh, so, uh, you know, your depressants are things like alcohol, barbiturates, uh, GHB is a, is a, is a, de is a depressant, right? Um, and then your stimulants, those are the drugs that actually rev up the central nervous system, right? They get you going. Those are your amphetamines, your caffeine, um, uh, nicotine is in that uh, category, uh, cat, Ritalin, um, they're psychomotor stimulants. Um, uh, and they, 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 get, they get the body going. And then hallucinogens is basically how it is affecting a person's perception for the most part, right? Um, and so that's how, how the drugs are, are categorized. Any questions on that? You will see some questions on categorizing, but- uh, Marijuana is the hardest one to categorize, no? It's, it's, it's a little bit about everything? Um, it's the present. Well, it's, it, it's not as, it, it, it's more hallucinogenic than anything, right? Um, it's not really a, a stimulant, right? So it's really, a, I would classify it more in, in the hallucinogenic type uh, properties. Yeah. Now, if you sprinkle a little methamphetamine on your joint, you're gonna get a little bit of both, right? You're gonna get your stimulant effects and you're gonna get uh, your, your uh, dazed effect as well. Um, any other questions on? All right. All right. So we talked about homeostasis in the second chapter, and we touched on it again in the third chapter. And now in chapter four, we're going to hit on it again. Um, and homeostasis is really important in this particular case because. Um, the next term I'm going to teach you is, the, is uh, what happens when homeostasis is dysregulated, right? And so homeostasis is the tendency for the body to seek and maintain a condition of balance, right? So I want you to think of like equilibrium. So it maintains your body temperature. It maintains your heart rate. It, uh, you know, it maintains um, uh, your breathing, right? There's... Um, the body always wants to go to its normal set point, right? Um, so simple uh, example of that um, is the body's ability to maintain an internal temperature of 98.6 degrees, right? So earlier we talked about that it does uh, fluctuate, but, um, but that is, the accepted standard, right? 98.6. We don't go too hot, we don't go too cold. That's homeostasis, right? Any questions on homeostasis? Oops. What happens when I click too fast? So once you introduce a stressor, to an organism, right? Um, 
that organism will respond to the stressor. And I'm gonna use the example of, uh, of drugs. Um, so homeostasis, right? So we have a body temperature of 98.6. Um, you know, our breathing rate is a certain way. Heart rate is a certain way. My neurotransmission is happening the way it normally does. And then I put methamphetamine into my system. And the body is going to react to the introduction of methamphetamine, right? So you're gonna have increased neurotransmission, dopamine release, there's gonna be a rush that high, it's going to increase um, uh, heart rate, your pupils are gonna get as, your eyes are gonna look black, your, your, <laughs> your uh, pupils will get so big. And, um, <clears throat> and that's because uh, methamphetamine is a, is a psychoactive stimulant and it has activated uh, basically kind of like the fight or flight response in a way, right? It's activating those sy systems. So that's what happens if I take it one time, right? If I continue to take it, then my body will move to a new level of a norm, right? Um, and so allostasis is the process by which the body responds to a stressor in order to regain homeo homeostasis. So remember your body is always wanting to get to its set point. Um, so allostasis basically means achieving stability through change. So if a person gets really hot, right? Uh, remember that our body temperature is 98.6. So um, that's our homeostatic state. Um, if we get too hot, what happens? We begin to sweat, right? Um, and that's designed to cool us off. So that would be an allostatic response. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? Because I really want to make sure you understand these two terms. All right, because you will see um, allostasis well, some of you might not, because remember some of the questions get pulled ram randomly, but um, allostasis and homeostasis are in the question bank for the exams. All right. So an allostatic load, um, or also what I call an allostatic state, is the pro prolonged neurochemical imbalance that has negative consequences for normal neural function. And what this has, what this is, is the, um, the body's basically responding to um, the constant stressor of having drugs added to their system, right? So again, using methamphetamine as an example, right? So, <clears throat> so your body actually physically changes. Right, so, um, and this is really, really important to know. Uh, one of the reasons why, uh, I wanna make sure I'm not jumping ahead. Sometimes I do that as I talk. Um, one of the reasons why relapse is so prevalent among substance use disorders is because the, the um, allostatic state has been in existence for so long that going through withdrawal is very unpleasant. Um, cravings can be very intense um, and, uh, and, and people don't want to go through, through that experience. Um, certain drugs are worse than others. Um, like for instance, methamphetamine, you have the crash. Um, uh, withdrawal isn't that great, right? Um, but but it's, it, it's not as bad as like heroin withdrawal which is, can be very painful, um, but heroin withdrawal will not kill you, whereas alcohol withdrawal um, will kill you or can kill you if, if not medically supervised. So and that's because your body's trying to return back to its homeostatic state. All right, any questions on Allostasis or homeostasis. So allostasis is the body trying to get back to homeostasis or after prolonged 
uh, prolonged use, it just becomes the new normal. Uh, whereas homeostasis is where you you genetically are your is your set point. This will come up. Um, we'll talk about it more as we go through. All right. So uh, we were talking about depressants earlier, right? And so some of this I've already given away because I jumped ahead when I was talking on that one slide. But depressants are drugs that suppress central nervous system activity, right? Um, you know, they include you know, alcohol, barbiturates, uh, ben benzodiazepines, uh, which by the way, withdrawing from any of these, if you've been using for a very long time, you need to be medically supervised because it is, um, it is dangerous to withdraw uh, from, from these depressants here. Um, with alcohol, you know, there's uh, decreased reaction time, decreased uh, visual acuity, you know, just don't see as well. Uh, it lowers levels of um, alertness. Uh, it reduces your behavioral um, and impulse control. And um, with enough alcohol can result in a complete loss of consciousness. Um, can result in a blackout, which is, you know, alcohol induced amnesia. You're not unconscious, you're up walking around, you're doing things, but the next day you're not gonna remember it. And so um, you'll recognize this channel um, here if uh, going back to chapter three, right? When we were talking about action potential and how, um, uh, uh, how the uh, sodium um, ions move into the neuron to, to um, activate um, action potential, right? It moves through these channels. This one is the exam is an example of a GABA gated chloride channel, um, which is embedded in the cell membrane of certain neurons, not all of them. Um, and it has what's interesting with this is you'll see that this has several receptor sites, right? So it has GABA receptor site, um, alcohol can bind to it, benzodiazepines, barbiturates can uh, can. Um, bind to it. And what that does is that opens the chloride channel, which allows negatively charged chloride ions to enter the cell body, changing its charge <clears throat> in a direction that pushes it away from firing. So this would be um, an uh, inhibitory um, response, right? And so uh, what ends up happening is the GABA neuron basically quiets down the brain, right? So that's one, one example of how, why this is classified as, as a depressant. All right, now stimulants uh, increase the overall levels of neural activity. So um, stimulants are usually, usually um, dopamine agonists. And who remembers what an agonist is? We talked about it uh, in the last chapter. Who remembers? Give you a shout out. Nobody? It keeps the, um, the neuron in the channel to keep it from, to keep it so that it goes into the receptor. It strengthens the effect of the neurotransmitter? Yes, it strengthens, it strengthens the length of the neurotransmitter. And then the, the, and then the first student that was talking, I'm sorry, I can't see who it was. Um, you are right in, in the sense that that could be an, an agonist thing that it does, right? That it binds to like a reuptake site so that the neurotransmitter remains in the synaptic gap longer, um, which is why it would be called an agonist, right? So an agonist is, is, a, is, a, is a molecule or a drug in this case that basically increases or enhances the strength of the neurotransmitter that it's targeting. So stimulants usually target dopamine. Um, and, and I kind of told you already that uh, in, in the last lecture that, that methamphetamine is one of those that can bind to the receptor because its molecular structure 
is similar enough to dopamine where the receptor site will, re will receive it. It's like a key in a lock. Um, and activate air action potential. The other thing that methamphetamine does is it can also enter the terminal button through the reuptake and actually uh, burst open the vesicles holding the dopamine, which releases a flood of dopamine into the synaptic gap. So it, it, it can do it a couple of different ways. Uh, like I said, methamphetamine is a pretty, pretty nasty drug. Um, and what's unfortunate with methamphetamine is because it is so powerful, it is extremely addicting. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, right? So dopamine activity is associated with reward and craving. So let's talk about dopamine uh, for a second. Who knows what the purpose of dopamine is in our brain, right? We already know it's a reward, but what's it connected to? Any ideas? What do you guys think? Feel good, like mood? Yes, it, it increases mood, but what activities, what behaviors can we engage in that releases dopamine that will make us want to repeat that behavior? Pleasure? Yes. Can you be more specific? Uh, that sex. Thank you. I knew somebody was going to say sex. <laughs> sex. Masturbation. Uh, that, yes, that's, that's part of sex. Yes, that is true. So sexual activity and eating, right, are two of the natural behaviors that, that we engage in that releases the most dopamine, right? And the reason why is, and that's connected to the pleasure reward system is because nature wants us to reproduce, right? To carry on humanity. So you would want that to be rewarding and also for our own survival. So eating is, when we eat, we release dopamine. So let's just say that having sex releases 300 units, and I'm just throwing out numbers here, so don't say Richard Grandstaff said um, <laughs> 300 units get released during sex. I'm just throwing out numbers to, to, um, uh, to demonstrate this. But let's say 300 units of, of dopamine gets released during sexual activity, right? It feels good, we wanna do it, um, and we repeat the behavior and we have kids and so on, right? Methamphetamine will probably release like 3000 units. Like that's how powerful it is. It is off the chart how much dopamine gets released and how much neural activity happens uh, as the result of methamphetamine use, right? Um, but it's also very damaging and um, uh, um, yeah, and it stops working after a while. I know I've worked with enough clients to know that, right? Um, it also increases strong craving. Uh, that's the other thing. So it's extremely highly, um, addictive. Um, other things with uh, stimulant use is it can mimic psychotic behaviors. People will see things, they will hear things, um, they will be peeking out their windows looking at shadow people, uh, and all of that is, you know, part of the uh, their brain being stimulated and also sleep deprivation as well impacts that. Um, the other thing, and I think this is what it says in your book, if I'm remembering correctly, um, it says it in lots of books actually, but one of the issues here is we see some um, uh, rock cocaine, right? Which is a smokable form of cocaine. And one of the reasons why it made it so addicting um, was because of its smokable form. So most people um, consume drugs in one of three ways, right? We either consume it orally, um, which is the slowest way that it can reach the brain. Um, we can inject it, which is the quickest way to get it into the bloodstream, but doesn't get to the brain as fast as smoking does. Um, inhalation is actually the fastest way to cross the blood-brain barrier 
although most people will believe um, uh, um, that actually IV use is, is the quickest way. And the difference is, is that IV use, you get the full effect, the full dose, um, whereas smoking, it gets there faster, but you may not get the full dose because some of it's destroyed by combustion. And then it sounds like somebody's unmuted. So is there a question? Can I, can I help there? No, I was going to say that, Professor, that when you, the, the, with, when you use the needle, you just get more of the drug quicker. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You get more of the drug, but it actually uh, is slower to get to your brain than smoking it. Not by much, but it is slower. So very good. Um, and then a question came in about um, sex addiction, addiction being um, a form of a stimulant. No, I, I, I w I've never heard it labeled that way and I've actually never thought about it in that way until this question came across. I look at um, sex addiction, addiction as being a, like a, a behavioral compulsion, but yes, it is involved in the release of dopamine, right? Um, and, and I'm not an expert in sex addiction, addiction. I think there's some other um, mechanics involved, but dopamine release is definitely part of it, right? Definitely part of it. Okay. All right, so here we are talking about dopamine agonists. Um, so remember an agonist is anything, is any substance, right? That, um, enhances the neurotransmitter being targeted. So in this particular case, we're looking at cocaine. And so what cocaine is doing here is cocaine is binding to, um, oh, let me turn on my, I'm using my pointer, but you can't see. So we have cocaine right here that is bound. Who knows what this channel is right here? Anybody know? What's that channel? The reuptake? That is the reuptake channel, right. And so when the cocaine binds there, it's going to prevent the dopamine from entering. So it cannot be taken up. So um, what that does is that leaves the dopamine in the synaptic gap longer to activate the next neuron. The other thing cocaine does as an agonist is it is similar enough in shape so it fits like a key in the lock to uh, sit on the receptor and um, act just like the dopamine would act. So it's doing two things, just like the, the uh, methamphetamine, only the methamphetamine will actually go through the reuptake. It doesn't just sit there. It, it actually it will get its way in there. Um, but this is an example of, of an agonist. So if it blocks reuptake, it's an agonist. If it uh, sits on the receptor cell and, um, and, and um, acts like or mimics the neurotransmitter, then it is an agonist. If it sits on the receptor cell and blocks and doesn't act like it, then it's an antagonist. So, um, so this is a carryover from the previous chapter. So you heard it chapter three and you're hearing it again in chapter four. So any questions on, on an agonist versus antagonist? All right, very good. All right, so nicotine and caffeine are also stimulants. Um, actually, caffeine is the world's most widely used uh, stimulant, at least last time I checked. So hopefully my, my information isn't incorrect, but I believe it is the most widely used. Um, and it increases levels of an alertness. I'm sure I like, I enjoy my cup of coffee every day. Um, and, uh, but I've actually cut down. I actually only have one cup a day now because uh, you can be diagnosed with a caffeine use disorder and you can experience caffeine withdrawal, which includes um, really severe headaches, for example, irritability. Um, nicotine is also um, a stimulant, 
and it interacts with uh, acetylcholine receptors, and it's also very highly addictive. And the thing with um, acetylcholine receptors is they're at various parts throughout your body as well. So uh, the nicotine can be binding in your brain, but in other areas too. Um, and this also plays a role in arousal and reward. Now come the opioids, which are um, analgesics and they're designed to actually decrease pain. Um, and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. They're also very highly addictive, it includes um, heroin, morphine, methadone, um, codeine. Those are probably ones that most people will know. Um, and the, the thing about opioids is, what's interesting about opioids is using opioids in and of themselves does not really cause a whole lot of damage to the body. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to think here. Actually, I might have a slide on it. So I might, I'll make a statement about it now. And then I think I have a slide later on that kind of demonstrates this. But um, damage to the body as a result of um, like opioid use is, is not that severe, but opioid use has a very high risk of overdose and death because um, it depresses breathing and um, it causes issues uh, like that. Hold on one second. It looks like I have a question on chat. So I got to turn off my uh, laser pointer. There we go. Sorry, my mouse is not responding well. Yeah, so yeah. And the, um, getting back to, there's a comment about um, caffeine withdrawal. And, uh, and what's interesting about um, the caffeine withdrawal, I'm going to go back to that just for a second. One of the reasons why we get headaches is because our um, blood vessels inside, you know, in our head, they actually expand. The reason why they're expanding is because they're getting ready for uh, the introduction of caffeine into our system. Stimulants are vasoconstrictors, right? And so what that means is, is that when, when you're taking a stimulant, um, if you're drinking uh, coffee, um, it's a vasoconstrictor. So it, it, it shrinks the veins, it has that effect um, while it's in the system. Same thing with um, methamphetamine and cocaine, um, which is actually um, quite frustrating to some men because if they're using meth and they enjoy sex on meth, the vasoconstriction um, causes erectile dysfunction. Um, and so they're extremely, their libido is really high, but their ability to perform is not so great. Um, and that's because of vasoconstriction. So with, with caffeine withdrawal, that's what's happening to you in the morning if you haven't had your coffee. And so um, the blood vessels expand and um, and it creates pain, right? Pressure and pain. So, all right. Uh, hallucinogens are those things that um, cause changes in our sensory perception. And that's what makes them hallucinogenic, right? Um, and of course, this is uh, variable, right? Um, with regards to the specific transmitters that they affect, uh, different ones for different things, right? So like LSD and, and uh, mescaline, you know, are serotonin agonists, which means they enhance the effect of serotonin. Whereas uh, PCP or ketamine, or AKA special K, um, are glutamate receptor antagonists. So in other words, they inhibit um, the effect of, uh, of the glutamate. So different mechanisms of actions that are happening here. Uh, but basically the result is, is it alters our perception and hence the reason for the classification of uh, hallucinogens. All right, so any questions on the classes of drugs? Uh, 
allostasis, homeostasis, definition of substance use disorder. All right. Okay, so now this is what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about stages of change. And one of the reasons why I bring up stages of change is as I throw it into this section with uh, the substance use disorders, because remember earlier, um, I, I, I talked about substance use disorders not only being a physiological issue, but it is also a psychological issue, right? And, um, and so that's kind of where, uh, um, so that's kind of where uh, I want to go right now is with like people's thoughts, cognitions, um, uh, their attitudes around their, their substance use, right? So I work with um, justice involved individuals. All of them have substance use disorders. All of them, um, well, for the most part, by the time they get to me, um, their substance use has progressed to a point where they are definitely in the severe category, right? So they're meeting six or more criteria for a substance use disorder. And often they're meeting 10 to 11 of the criteria, right? Um, but some of them don't think that they have a problem, even though I am screening them, interviewing them, and they're handcuffed to a table at George Bailey detention facility, right? Um, but they really do not see their substance use as a problem. So that's the first stage in the stages of change model, also known as the trans theoretical model of change. Um, and there are five stages. So the first stage is pre-contemplation. And so people who are in the pre-contemplation stage of change do not see an issue with the behavior that's in question. So, um, and, I, and, and where I work, we actually deal with several behaviors. It's not just the substance use disorder, it's also criminal behavior. Um, so they don't see an issue with their criminal behavior. They don't see an issue with um, their uh, substance using behavior. That's a person who is pre-contemplative. They have no intent on changing any time in the next six months. And actually, to be honest with you, a person can sit in pre-contemplation for years, right? Um, they, can, they can sit there for years. Now, interestingly too, uh, and this may sound counterintuitive, a person could be pre-contemplative and still realize that they're having issues, but they're gonna blame it on something else. Um, they're, they're gonna find some other reason why um, they're in the trouble that they're in, right? Um, I had one guy tell me during the, during the screening, he said, uh, yeah, the only reason why I'm here is because um, you know, I, I used, I used my uh, heroin and I nodded off, uh, which I was supposed to be doing. And he was supposed to be driving um, and he pulled over and used and nodded off and we both got caught. <laughs> A very pre-contemplative statement, right? Like my heroin use was not the problem. If my buddy hadn't used, he was not supposed to use, um, I would not be sitting here in jail, right? So definitely not, not seeing an issue, right? The next stage is contemplation. And what's really important with contemplation, how you know a person is in contemplation is because of their, the way they're speaking, their narrative, um, there's um, uh, uh, aspects of ambivalence. In other words, they're sitting on the fence. They know they have a problem. They can see the consequences of it. They might even go, you know, I really should try to make some changes, but I don't want to. I really, I really think I want to keep doing this, right? So they're in, they're doing some sustained talk, in other words, staying in the problem, and they're doing some change talk, 
which is, yeah, I'm, you know, I can see the benefit of changing. Um, I, I might want to do it, but they're, they're just sitting on the fence. They're thinking about it. Um, and maybe they have a, uh, an intention to maybe change in the next six months, right? But it's still kind of up in the air. They're on the fence. The next stage is known as preparation stage. And in this stage, people have made a commitment to change within the next 30 days. So in other words, they've resolved that ambivalence. They've moved out of the contemplation stage of change. And they're saying, okay, I recognize I got these problems. This really sucks. I need to make a change. And, and that person might begin making changes, right? I mean, plans, plans to change. So maybe if they're an alcoholic, for instance, maybe they call up the, the local AA central office or Google AA meetings and they'll go, oh, there's a meeting by my house. Okay, maybe I'll check that out in the next month, right? So this is a person who's investigating things there. They might even make some small steps toward the behavior change. Um, they might try out some strategies uh, and look out and look for some resources, right? Like calling a, a central office, for example. That's a person in preparation. The next stage is action. And in the action stage of change, um, this person has made overt changes that are perceptible, right? Um, but they've been doing it for less than six months. Um, they start going to meetings. Um, maybe they, maybe they haven't stopped drinking all the way, but they've cut back severely, like a lot, right? Um, maybe they pick up a sponsor. Maybe they actually set a quit date and then they, and they do it, right? Um, so this is a person who is uh, in action stage of change. And then the last stage of change is maintenance. And in the maintenance stage of change, um, they've engaged in their plans. It's becoming routine. Um, they are uh, actually doing things in order to prevent relapse, right? <coughs> they're, they're building a structure in their life that kind of insulates them from, from relapse. They're making maybe new friends. They get a sponsor, they start working steps. Maybe they go to an outpatient treatment program, get involved in that, and they're doing that. Um, uh, and, and, and that might carry over from action as well. A person in action might do the, that same thing. But in maintenance, they've been doing it for at least six months. Um, and people in this stage usually report the highest levels of self-efficacy um, and are less frequently tempted to relapse. In other words, there are some real internal changes that have been occurring within this individual um, that is taking them further and further away from uh, using. So those are the five stages of change. Sometimes you will hear, and I hear this among, um, it's funny, we were having this discussion where I worked the other day with, uh, with a new counselor and she said, oh no, I was told there were six stages of change. I'm like, no, there are five stages of change. Relapse is not a stage of change in the trans, ther, trans theoretical model of change. Relapse is a situation where a person uh, begins to uh, uh, use again, if we're talking about drugs, or they return to a previous behavior and a previous lifestyle and they kind of continue on with that. Um, there's no change happening there. They've returned to what they were doing. So that is not a stage of change. And then on some stage of change models, if you Google it, you'll also see number six as termination. Um, some places you don't see it as termination as stage six, other places you do. Um, but for the purposes of my class, um, and if you um, work in my center, there are five stages of change and I kind of insist on that. Termination is also an event, it's not a stage. And a person terminates the stages of change once they've completed and gone through maintenance and they just have a new life. There is no more changing happening. 
So the stages of change have ended because they've gone from their old lifestyle to their new lifestyle. So relapse and termination are not stages of change. Um, so any questions on that? I have a question. Yes. Why is it so common for relapse to be in the stages of change? Relapse is not in the stages of change. And that's what I'm trying to em emphasize. Relapse. Why, why wait, hold on. I've seen this before. Hold on, hold on one second. Hold on. Because yeah, I know I know where you're going. Yeah. Go so ahead. Re relapse is um, the result of a substance use disorder. So remember, the other thing about a substance use disorder is uh, I believe the SAMHSA definition of substance use disorder includes a chronic progressive relapsing disease. So relapse is a part of having a substance use disorder. So that's where relapse comes in. The other thing I wanna stress about relapse for those AOD counselors in here, and I know we have about five or future you know, people that work in the field already. Um, there is a difference between relapse and lapse, right? Um, relapse is one of those terms that gets thrown around the 12 step rooms, the recovery rooms, a any use is a relapse. And clinically speaking, that's absolutely not true. So for example, I'm working with a guy right now who, uh, came in for meth, he also has alcohol issues, alcohol use disorder, um, and he recently tested positive for alcohol use, right? And so when I was talking with him and working with him about that, he said, yeah, he said, I meant to come in and tell you about it. He said, I had the drink. I knew as soon as it happened, um, you know, that, uh, that I had made a mistake, right? So, what happened there, and this is very, words are important. What happened there was, is he had a recurrence of alcohol consumption. He had a drink. He did not relapse because he did not continue drinking. Relapse is a continuation, a return to that previous behavior. So he had a recurrence, a lapse. Uh, he got, uh, he called his sponsor, he told his sponsor about it right away. Now, unfortunately he didn't come in and tell us because we're drug court and he was worried about going to jail. So that kind of prevented him from doing that. But all the other aspects of what he did um, indicate that he kind of came right back in. So sometimes you can see the um, stages of change demonstrated in a circle. And unfortunately I don't have it in this, um, particular slide, I might add this to it because the visual can be very helpful. But imagine a circle where the stages of change are arranged around the circle and a relapse is an arrow going off the circle. So a person that relapses leaves the stages of change. They stop changing, right? They, re re they go back into their um, substance use. A person that has a recurrence right, um, may not be considered as leaving the stage of change because it's not a relapse. Um, he might come back in at a, uh, let's see if I can turn on my pointer, laser pointer. So let's just say that he was in this area of the stages of change, right? He's down here, he has his drink. Maybe he's struggling a little bit. Maybe he did drop back into um, contemplation a little bit, thinking, oh, I can get away with it just once. That's really kind of like a comp contemplation stage of thinking. And if you'll notice over here, I have a comment that people move in and out of the stages, sometimes repeatedly. They can also go back and forth through the stages. So a person can um, move from contemplation to preparation to action and then slide backwards again, right? Um, it may not result in, in a recurrence of use, um, but they can, uh, this isn't just unidirectional. It can go both ways. So um, 
So Eduardo, I'm sorry I, I cut you off a little bit because I thought I knew where you were going. Did I, and I wanted to finish my thought also, oops. Um, did I answer your question? I was just gonna, I was just uh, getting to the point. Why is it so common that, um, Never mind. Yeah, I, I see I've, the way I, I was taught was the circle. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, but then, okay, I get it. Yeah, and so remember on the circle, the way you were taught, relapse usually is shown off the circle, isn't it? And there's usually like I a little arrow back, going. It would go back to pre-contemplation. But I, okay, from, I, yeah, never liked like, that. I never liked that model, you know, the circle model. Yeah, because you, know, you don't necessarily. It kind of makes it uh, seem like a cycle more than like a stage of change. You know, this this makes it more clear. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's why I kind of like using it this way. But sometimes the circle can be helpful for other students. and But I just haven't put it in this. The other thing I'll say is you're right. It does make it look like a cycle, right? And, and ideally, a person who goes through, who successive, successfully navigates all five stages of change would end up at termination and be done. But just because a person has a recurrence or even a full-on relapse, in other words, they return to the behavior for a while, when they come back into the stage of change, they don't necessarily come back at pre-contemplation. They could come in at preparation. So it is not true that because a person relapses, they come back at pre-contemplation. That's not true. Um, they can come back in at, at, a, at a further along in the stages. And the reason why is based on their previous experience. Remember one thing with substance use disorders, uh, SAMHSA put out a study a couple of years ago that showed that on average, on average, it takes a person seven treatment episodes before they actually are successfully able to terminate the stages of change and actually have a different lifestyle. Seven times. So, um, but with each time that somebody tries it, they're getting closer and closer to that goal of abstinence or behavior change, right? So that's why I'm saying just because a person relapses, they don't automatically come back into pre-contemplation. Maybe early on, maybe they do, but if they've had several episodes behind them and they've got some recovery experience or some treatment experience, they may come in at preparation and go, you know what, that relapse, that was awful. I never wanna do that again. I've learned my lesson. I, you know, I gotta figure out what I missed. So they're coming in at a much higher stage of change. Does that make sense? And I know I'm kind of talking to you, Eduardo, but it's really I've, for everybody. I've seen, I've seen it. I've seen that happen before. So they, should, they either jump into contemplation or even action. You know, they'll start going to meetings. Um, yeah, they jump right back in. Right exactly. back in. That's true. They, they jump right back in. Right. Okay. So I had a question come up that says, is recurrence more popular than relapse? So I'm going to make an exception. Um, uh, um, no, I don't want to make an assumption of what, what you meant by most popular, more popular. Can you rephrase the question in a different way? I um, just meant that um, it seems like from my experience is that more people relapse and just have a short, um, like one quick little mistake. It seems like most people fall back into relapse. I just seems like in my experience, it seems like that happens more than the reoccurrence. So I was just wondering if you knew if it, it ha if that recurrence happened more than the relapse, because okay. from what I've it, yeah, more relapse than recurrence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So more prevalent than relapse. So is yeah. is recurrent more prevalent than relapse? Um, right. And I I don't know. I don't have any statistics behind it. Um, and it sounds like what you're what you're talking about right now is your anecdotal experience. I have right. my my anecdotal experience um, uh, that would say that. You know, for me, it's like 50 50, to be honest. But again, it's it's anecdotal. I would love to see a study and I'll bet somebody's done it 
on, um, I just haven't looked for it, on uh, lapse versus relapse, right? Right. And the other thing about relapse too, and clinically speaking, clinically speaking, a person can't be considered to have relapsed if they have not been engaged in a behavior change for more than six months or less than six months. Wait, am I saying that right? Hold on. In other words, the behavior change has to have occurred for a certain length of time clinically, right? So, um, so if they're in early remission, for instance, which happens at three months of a substance use disorder abstinence, if they're in early remission um, up to about six months, you, you may be able to consider that a relapse. Anything prior to that, there hasn't been enough change. Um, there was only a cessation of use, but no other changes really. And so that might be just considered continued use with a break in between, if that makes sense. So, um, uh, so for the AOD students or anyone familiar with recovery or 12-step philosophy, we really have to separate what relapse means in the rooms versus what relapse, lapse, and recurrence mean clinically for our clients. So, all right. Any other questions on the stages of change? Are the stages of change specific to substance use or just any um, behavior? So that's an excellent question. Initially, when the stages of change were first being kind of formulated um, by uh, Prochaska and Di Clemente, um, it was focused on, on substance use, right? Um, but it is actually uh, applicable to any behavior change that you might wanna go to, right? So I wanna change my diet, right? Or I wanna get healthier, or I wanna start working out, or I wanna start going hiking, right? Um, the stages of change apply to any behavior change that we want to engage in. So it's a great question. Mm. And here's the other thing about stages of change. Depending on the, the subject, right? You might be in one stage of change for going to the gym and a different stage of change for eating healthier. So uh, a person that might be going to the gym every day and they're in action, um, they're in the action stage of change for, for uh, going to the gym and working out, uh, but they're coming home and they're killing a, you know, a, a half a sheet of cake, right? So they're in, in contemplation or pre-contemplation for eating better, right? Does that make sense? Yes, it does, thank you. All right, and um, let's see here. Any other questions? All right, so I got one coming through the chat. Oh, the uh, National Academy of Sports Medicine uses stages of change model in their curriculum to teach personal trainers how to understand and motivate clients. And that's beautiful. Um, and here's why. The other reason why stages of change, and I wasn't gonna get too much into it right now um, uh, for tonight, but I will make a brief mention of it. Um, and thank you for that comment, and allowing me to share that with the class, is that assessing a person's stages of change is important if you're working with them because you have to use the correct interventions for the correct stage in order for it to be effective. So for example, if I'm working with um, a person who is smoking and he tells me, I have no intention on smoking. I, I know you guys don't like it that I smoke. I have no intention of stopping smoking. Um, just forget about it. And I put him in a nicotine cessation relapse prevention class that is a total mismatch. That person is not ready for it. And what are they going to do? They're gonna be disruptive. They're gonna buck against the system. Um, it's gonna push them away. Uh, it might push them deeper into their uh, pre-contemplation. They're gonna dig their heels in. So it's really important to understand 
where a person is in their st stage of change so that you're using the correct intervention so that you don't drive them deeper into the behavior that, um, that would be beneficial for them to change. So, um, and we'll talk more about that in the uh, therapy chapter, because that's when I would have hit on this again. Um, but that's why it's important to know what stage of change a person is in. All right, so are we ready to do our, our group um, exercise thing? So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you two videos here. Uh, they're two music videos. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, and what I want you to do for each video is uh, just pull out a piece of paper and just kind of jot down some notes on, on what you think, what stage of change you think the person um, that's being highlighted in the video is engaged in. Like what's the content of the song that might, might be, what's, what's the look on their face? What, you know, what are they presenting? Um, do they think they have a problem? Do they, uh, uh, are, are they um, engaging, you know, do they want to engage in any behavior change? Um, what is it that you're seeing? So that's what, kind of what I want you uh, to kind of like jot down. And then after we watch both videos, I'm going to put you guys into breakout rooms and you guys can talk about it as a group. And um, each group will um, elect a spokesperson. And I'll be honest, we may not get through all the groups, um, uh, but I wanna do this exercise so that you kind of like have a little bit of hands-on uh, and then we'll come back together and talk about it. Now, before I do that, I had another question that came in. It was a great question um, that says, does this tie in with using um, smart goal templates? Um, yes, with stages of change, you do want to use smart goal templates, um, matching that intervention, um, seeing what their motivations are, and then using their motivations to create their smart goals. Which, uh, for those that don't know, SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, or achievable. I've seen it both ways. Uh, relevant or rewarding. I've seen it both ways there. And time bound. So, in other words, you, you have a goal that, that the following week you can say, yes, I did this, here's the evidence that I did it, and look what happened, right? So yes, yeah, SMART goals, very important for that. Um, all right, so any questions on getting back to the, to the group exercise we're gonna do? Any questions on that? All right, so pull out a piece of paper. Jot down what you think. And uh, let's go to the first video. Oh, first, let me pause for a second. All right, so here is the first song. It's a cover, by the way. All right, so that has a lot of imagery in it. There's a lot of stuff going on, um, uh, but I want you to just kind of think about it for a second. Um, maybe you've been jotting down some notes. Um, if you, some of you may not know the story of Johnny Cash, but he, uh, he definitely had some substance use issues throughout his life and um, uh, which, uh, which he worked on, um, well, he worked on for a very, very long time. Um, so some things that he talks about, right? Like the needle tears a hole. He's talking about a lot of regret. He's talking about a lot of behaviors that he had engaged in, right? Um, so just be thinking about that when you're thinking about what possible stage of change he might be in, okay? Um, all right, now we're gonna move to the second song. And uh, again, same thing, take some notes, listen, enjoy. And some of you might recognize her already. <laughs>
All right. So jot down some notes from that as well. I tell you, every time I play this one, I mean, watching her video really makes me sad. Uh, who knows what happened to Amy Winehouse? I'm sure people do. Overdose. Yeah, yeah. She, she, uh, she died. Um, and such a waste of talent, such a young life, um, and, uh, and died as the result of, of experiencing her own struggles with a substance use disorder. And uh, it's, it's uh, really, really quite sad. So, all right, so jot down your notes. I am going to uh, pause the recording because we're going to, um, all righty. So we've come back from our groups and we've had our discussion. Uh, that was an awesome, awesome, lively discussion. Um, you guys did a, a great job. I'm just gonna kind of back it up here, back to the uh, uh, stages of change and just kind of wrap up, right? So in the two videos, um, you know, Johnny Cash, that video is, is a little bit complex. You, did, you guys did a great job uh, with that, right? Some people said contemplation stage of change and there's certainly some arguments that could be made for that. Um, and then I liked how one of the students pointed out at the very end of the song, he says, um, I will find a way, right? And that that may have been indicative of him either, you know, resolving his ambivalence, moving into preparation, moving into the action stage of change. So, so, uh, so great job on that. And then um, Amy Winehouse, of course, um, uh, definitely everyone was in agreement that, that she was demonstrating the uh, pre-contemplation stage of change, although there was some aspects of some change talk, like, you know, the line that says, you know, I don't want to drink anymore, uh, but I still need my friend, like referring to her other substance use uh, issues. Um, and, uh, you know, and Amy struggled, struggled for a long time. And, and this song kind of goes along with her story. And it's, and it's a, and it's a sad, uh, it's a sad case, but uh, you guys did a great job. Um, I would agree, pre-contemplation um, throughout most of that song, right? They try to send me to rehab and I won't go, no, no, no. Um, uh, she was able to recognize some issues, but even with that, was just not ready to change her behavior. And sadly, as we know the story, um, it ended up, uh, it ended up killing her. So, all right, so that's it for tonight. You guys have been great. Uh, class is dismissed and you all have a very nice evening.